Big Gab, episode 351 for Tuesday, July 26th, 2022. Folks, and welcome to or welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. How are we today, Mr. Kent? We're pretty good tonight, Mr. Hamilton. Yes, it is tonight. That's true. While we were recording this, we've moved. It's 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 generally not sun, sunny out when we record anymore. So, but, but you can't tell that from the studio that you're in, right? I cannot tell that from my studio. No, my studio is the, the, is completely artificial, uh, temperature and uh, artificial climate and artificial light here. I am sealed off from the outside world. It looks exactly the same as it would if it were noon, even though it's almost mm. midnight. So yeah, I don't know it's just how it is. It's, you know, it, it, to soundproof this room, it meant that the easiest way to do that was, uh, in part by blocking the windows. So we actually built these like sandwiches of all kinds of insulation, different types of insulation that mount inside the window frames. So it was kind of a crazy little thing, but you know, they work. So you know. I've never been to your studio that one time I was supposed to be there and yeah. something happened. That's right. But, yeah. I mean, it's fascinating to me what people will do. Russ built a drum studio out in his, uh, my, my last drummer, Russ, yeah. he built a beautiful, beautiful drum studio out and, you know, he had a, had a pretty big yard and, um, you know, the kind of double hung walls and all that type yep. of stuff. That's, that's what you mine can't are. Hear it. Yeah. You can't hear a thing outside it. You cannot, you can't hear it. even, and he's drumming. You can't even sense vibrations from kick drums or anything like that. That's great. Yeah. That, that's, that's how it should be. I, I assume he floated the floor in there too. Is that right? I would guess. Yeah. yeah like I said, that's that's the one thing I did not do here. I didn't float the floor because I'm on the second floor of this building. My office is underneath. And so I figured, well, I'll never be in both places at once. I don't care if the sound leaks down. It's going to be fine. Uh, I did mm. not factor in that for several years I would have my daughter playing as a drummer and they might have band mm -hmm. rehearsal in the studio in the afternoon after school. But that was uh, actually a very welcome uh, the added noise. I, I didn't mind it at all, but it was interesting when we, you, you mentioned Russ's double hung walls. I did the, uh, the same thing. I the, you use this stuff. They call it Z channel, but instead of screwing the, uh, the sheetrock into the studs, you screw this. Uh, it, it's a, it's an aluminum strip that floats. It's shaped, I guess, kind of like a Z, uh, where it keeps the sheetrock about a half inch off of maybe not quite a half inch, but uh, uh, off of the studs, and you and then you screw the you screw that into the studs, and then you screw the sheetrock into the Z channel off center from the stud, so that you don't accidentally you know uh, short circuit it into the into the stud, and it it's amazing how how well that works. It was interesting when we did it, we floated the walls. And uh, had not yet mudded the room. And, and I say we, I did, I did none of this work, Paul. <laughs> I, I paid somebody to do it. So let's just be perfectly clear about this. Uh, actually, I did a little bit of it, but that, it doesn't really count. But, uh, you know, we floated them. And I, before we mudded, I had Lisa come up here, my wife come up here, and hit my bass drum as hard as she possibly could. And I went downstairs and it was like, okay, right at the bottom of the, the stairs, I could feel it, which made sense. It was coming through the floor. But as I got, I don't know, maybe 10 feet away from the building, it, it just disappeared. There was nothing. And and we put mineral fiber insulation in the walls. So that deals with the high end. It, the floating of them deals with the low end. Because if you, right, right. Right, if you screw sheetrock in, it effectively turns your room into a low end speaker. So um, so it was like, okay, great. And then the guys came and, and mudded the walls. And I had Lisa do the experiment again and I could feel that kick drum pounding me in my chest at the end of my driveway. And I'm like, what did these guys do? And, and it was, I had uh, consulted with a company called Oralex that I bought a bunch of the uh, soundproofing gear from. And they told me, they're like, look, it's either a hundred percent or zero. There is no 99% on this. 
And they said, one of the things you really need to make, make sure is that when you mud things, you don't wind up mudding to something that is connected to the sheetrock. So I grabbed a putty knife and I just went around and looked for anything. And the only thing I found was about a centimeter thick piece of mud that had fused between the sheetrock and an outlet, like a J box for a, you know, for an electrical outlet. And, and for that, what you're supposed to do when we hadn't done it yet was put uh, silicone around it just to seal the high end stuff from getting through, but you're not supposed to, you know, uh, tie the the sheetrock to the outlet. I'm like, well, it's only a little, like it's less than a centimeter, but I cut that and I went outside and it was gone. And I was like, really oh amazing. amazing. Yeah, it really, it was, it was, and I mean, they said it, but it, I didn't believe them. Like I, I thought you'd have to have more than that to actually make it work, but evidently no, no. So amazing. it is amazing, but it's nice to be able to play and not really worry about, you know, too much sound leaking out. So, yeah. Uh, did you play this weekend? I did. I had two gigs last weekend. So, uh, two, uh, one was a concert in the park type gig yep. and that we've done for years. And one was a, a concert in the vineyard that we've done for years. And, and both of the things, you know, we have, they're those nice type of gigs where we have a big connection to the people who come to them. So, sure. so the, the winery one we did, we've been doing it for a long time and, the owners of the winery are friends and family and, you know, there's definitely a good connection there. And it's something we looked forward to every year and we played quite well. And, uh, although I'll tell you, you know, my band is a notoriously slow starting band. Interesting. We, 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 you know, and some of it is situation and circumstance. Like we have high hopes to kind of come out of the gate you know, rock and, and in a lot of places we play, you know, people are still filling in in the first couple of songs. And then we're, you know, high energy, you know, before the audience buzz really dries. So some of it is, is the nature of the gigs that we do. Generally, when we play a, like when we do take a festival gig and there's already a crowd there that's already been warmed up and is really hot to go. Yeah. Uh, those, those are great gigs, even though I hate doing festival gigs because the setup time, sure. the, the audience vibe is really good. That makes sense. But some of these concerts we do, you know, we want to come out and try and set a tone. And often, like we're doing the bitches back as, as an opener and, you know, kind of high energy. Yeah. And uh, it's, a, it's often lost as, the, on a, as a song when the crowds are not in a dancing mood yet or kind of, you know, eating their picnic or something like that. And more often, something like Domino is a good, yep. you know, mid tempo ish, groovy, you know, type of thing. So, so it's funny when, when I played in in Groove Syndicate, the the band that that played played a lot of gigs similar to what you guys do with the House Rockers. Domino was for exactly the same reason was often the yeah. opener. Yeah, yeah, that or or Not like a uh, blaring in your face thing, and yeah, you know, that or and, that or pick up the pieces or something like that, just to. You know, just to kind of get rolling. So, yeah. Just to get rolling. But, you know, the whole concept of getting rolling is an interesting thing to me because uh, I know we have a question uh, that someone sent in about vocal rehearsals and vocal warm-ups. And, and, we'll get there. You know, yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll get there. I would say that I would like to be able to hit the ground running and never look at the first two or three songs as warm-up songs. That always bothers me, but you know, I, I've often played in, you know, different things in the past where people are not vocal warmer uppers. Yeah. Right. And so the more challenging range things, it takes them three or four songs before they're ready to do that. And I always think that's, you know, I think people are coming for the first song too. Right. Yep. And they may not be ready for, you know, blaring, you know, high energy in the first song, but you know, I think that's kind of the fun is to see what you can do to s there, you know, there's taking what the defense will give you, right? Like the, the mood of the room yes. and there's trying to set the mood and, you know, you have to be a pretty good band to, to set the mood. You have to, you know, it, it takes a really good set list, you know, that shows off strengths in different ways. Um, if you want to not just play to the room, if you want to be the room, you know what yep. I mean? Yeah. You got to define it. It's a, you know, I always think of a performance, whether I'm, an attendee or a performer, it's an exchange of energy, right? Like, but more often than not, it must start from the stage. If, 
if the performer does not initiate the exchange of energy in a way that's going to land with the audience, then it, it, it's very hard. It, it, it's very rare, I should say, uh, that the crowd will be the thing that sort of kicks that off. It needs to be you. Yeah. As the performer, I think. And it doesn't take much, nope. you know, for people for the are there to be made. And yeah. Yeah. People are there to have a good time. Yeah. That, that's always true. But that, it's a really interesting question. Are, are you a band that wants to dictate the vibe from down beyond, or are you a band that reads the room and adjusts your set as you go? It, it, it is kind of there. It's two approaches. And I'm not going to sit here and say it one's right or one's wrong. And I'm also gonna, not going to say that one is more conducive to what you shared in terms of, you know, igniting the spark. Yeah. So no right or wrong, but they are two different approaches. And, you know, we've often said that playing in a band is uh, an exercise in trying to show by everybody how right you are, right? <laughs> you know, like your taste, your song selection, your show is a, is a series of, of decisions that you want to experience the satisfaction of winning over an audience with, right? Yeah. Well, and it's also good to remember that most audiences want to be won over. Rare, rarely is it an antagonistic thing, right? And I and I I I'm often I often find myself reminding younger musicians and younger bands this, like, you know, if you make a mistake or whatever it is, it's okay. Like the audience is rooting for you to succeed. That's why they're there, right? Like for most of them. I mean, sometimes you get that jackass that's out there that, you know, wants to see you fail. But, but another the, musician, another <laughs> generally another musician. The guy who's through there with his arms crossed. That's is definitely right. Another musician. Yeah. But you're not playing for that guy. Screw that guy, right? You're, <laughs> you're there to entertain the people that want to be entertained. Like that's the whole right. point, right? So everybody showed up, except for that guy, with the same goal in mind. And, and so it's not that difficult to take them across the finish line. Now, if you come out of the gate and you're way too loud or whatever, like that can be a major problem or, you, you know, you can you, dig yourself in a hole. You can dig yourself in a hole. That's right. Yeah. 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 But, but otherwise, if you're, if you're smart about it, you can, you can lead the way. Um, but it takes some confidence, not cockiness. Although there, there is a place for cockiness in the right doses. Uh, you are, you, you know, you are the performer on stage. And so people want to see confidence for sure. Uh, they, you know, they don't want to see somebody that's up there, you know, Oh, is this okay? Are you guys all right? You know, that there are a few notable exceptions for whom that works, but by and large, that's, that's, that wouldn't be how I would advise people to go about starting a show. You know, let's well, always be performing, right? Always be performing. Yeah. We played, um, we played two gigs this weekend with bitter pill Saturdays was the second of two. It was an outdoor gig at Eastman's farm uh, late afternoon and it was hot as ever outside. I mean, it, we, you know, we've had this heat wave that blew through new England or the Northeast really uh, this over the past, whatever, five or six days. And Saturday, it was just sweltering, especially while we were setting up. Thankfully we were covered. And by about, we started at four, we played four to seven by a, Certainly by five and maybe even before that, the entire area where the crowd was sitting was also in the shade. So it it worked out OK. But it was it was one of those gigs where it was really hard to make it a high energy gig. Uh, the crowd didn't really want high energy. We didn't want to deliver high energy or at least uh, we weren't delivering high energy. Let me put it that way. It was, it was just hot. It was, and it was fine. Like it, everybody we entertained, it, things went well. We played fairly well. I actually had a problem during the first set. My drumsticks literally kept slipping out of my hands. I had to switch at set break. I had to go to my car and get a, a pair of sticks that, uh, that didn't have any shellac on them. They only had beeswax on them and that, that worked a lot better, but it was, you know, it was hot and it was just one of those things. But man, Friday night was one of those gigs that was magic. And we, we, it will be a long time before we forget what that was like. We wound up playing at the uh, Portsmouth Music Hall Lounge in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which is a newly revamped venue. They, 
They put in a great sound system. They, I mean, every, they gutted the place and just rebuilt this, this room. Uh, we sold it out. They had like brand new, really great sound gear. They had a back line with, I mean, the drum set was this, you know, $2,500 brand new uh, DW frequent flyer kit that just sounded fantastic. It, it was, it was just crazy what they, what they put in there, but they knew they wanted to have a, a setup that was, that was, um, it, you know, that, that, that gave bands a good chance of having a great show. And we had a great show, but you know, it was, there are, there are more than two types of bands, but you know, I, I've, I've certainly played my share of gigs in bands where the vibe is to have everybody up and dancing and it's the party. And Friday night was not that. Friday night was everybody was seated and they were watching the performance. And man, not only did the band play well, I mean, like we played really well. The crowd was paying attention to every single thing. They applaud, you know, the applause came at the right times and it was thunderous. And after the gig, it, I mean, I didn't have any gear to pack out because I used their drums. I mean, I had cymbals or whatever, but that was it. It still took me an hour and a half to get out of there because people kept coming up to us and talking to us and people that were like, oh, you know, I had some people, I, it, it, various things from different people, but every one of them noticed something very specific and was like, oh, this thing was great that you didn't. It's like, man, a lot of that stuff we either do for our ourselves as a band and some of it, like the things I do like on the drums sometimes, really, I just do for me. I don't even know if the band notices, but, you know, I keep myself entertained sometimes. People are like, no, no, we, I caught this and I caught that. It was just one of those magic little evenings that, uh, that'll live with us for a very long time. And it was, it was I wonderful. I love that. I'm happy for you. Thank That's you. That's great. Yeah. You know, I'd actually would like to put in a reservation right now to revisit the whole, why is dancing the only metric of success in, you know, in so many cases? It's, right? it's, yeah, it's, it's, it doesn't need to be. It, it doesn't need to be. Um, well, or, or your band should be ready for all of them, right? Like, you know, if you're a bar band, you know, that might, that may be the, the, that's going to be your metric that. most of the time. That's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But you know, can your band be a concert band? Like I always wanted the house rockers to be able to play theaters. Yeah. And you know, I, I when I run this concept by people that you know, they would say, well, you know, where are people going to dance? And I'd be like, right. Are we able to entertain people to get them out of their seat, standing in the aisles and having a good time? That is a thing too, you know. But but can what, you entertain what people like? while they're sitting in their seats, right? Like, can can you play a show that is entertaining for people and has them captivated without getting up? Like, I mean, it's and a, that's you know, a, it's that's a, a good thing. question because yeah. that's a thing. That's a it's a different type of skill. Usually, I would like to think rock and roll music just by its nature is going to get people's blood going as opposed to a little bit more of a cerebral exchange of musicianship, which might be more what, I don't know. I went to see Rush and yes, a lot as a kid and, and yes. Uh, it, and uh, while most of the time the crowd was standing for those shows, it wasn't a dancing crowd for either one of those bands. Yeah, but standing counts. I mean, were people in the, were people in the, in the seat standing. Yes. Yeah. 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 Sure. That's I see point. what you're saying. Yeah. Well, I don't. I mean, of, you, get, you get them out of their seats. But I, I like. There were two people that got out of their seats during one song uh, on Friday night at the Bitter Pill show. Uh, this this couple, these two women, got up and were slow dancing to one of our new songs, "Miss You," and it was wonderful. But they were the only ones that that got up and then they sat back down and watched the show after that. But they were, they were moved to dance and that was obviously totally fine. Nobody had any issue with it, but it was the exception rather than the rule. And I can tell you everybody in that place was watching what we were doing and entertained. Well, except for one guy at one point, we saw some, we saw one guy talking while we were playing a tune and somebody near him reached over and politely shushed him. And the guy was like, oh, I'm so sorry. He, you know, he just lost the moment there. Alcohol does that to people, right? You know, you, yeah. you, you, you realize you have a really important story to tell and you forget what's happening around you and you start telling the story. And, and once he was reminded of it, everything was fine. There was no altercation or anything, but it was really interesting. It was actually really kind of cool to see somebody Easy. shush someone. I was like, oh, hey, look at that. That's actually really nice. Yeah. <laughs> I was actually thinking about this so. very topic because 
I was thinking about how um, how good grooves are, even to not dance. Like, yeah. is there music that is not dance music, but the groove is so undeniable that that you get into it? And I and it's and it's present Steely in a lot Dan, of music. maybe. Yeah, I'm not a big Steely Dan guy, but I get wow. I get the. I get the I get the reference, but I mean I was listening to some Jackie Green the other day, so this sure. is just kind of like that acoustic Americana, you know, mid tempo stuff. Yeah, but the groove is so good. I mean, you do you just find yourself swaying and you're into the music, and that's a really interesting question. Can you can your band do those tempos and still get get people moving? Yeah. It doesn't have to be you know a wild dance, but can you move people with groove? Yeah, is can it, you move there, people at at anything other than 120 BPM? Right. 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 Yeah. yeah. It's, it, it, it's, it's a skill and, and the whole band has to be into it. It's not just, you know, it's not just well played. I mean, if you, if you're, if, if you're in a party band and you play four on the floor, 120 BPM, at least 50% of the people are just going to start moving. That, that is, that it, there is something human about that. Right. But trying to do that at, 100 BPM or 80, that starts to get really interesting. It's yeah. got it. There's nuance to it. There's subtlety to the groove. You've got space. to play. What's that? Space. Space. Yeah, you're playing the space. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you had a. I'm glad you had a magic gig. It was magic. Those things. Yeah. Are, you know, we we have come close to that. I think we've only had one or two in our busy season this year yeah. that have been end to end. Well, like great. I, we have a great of a three hour show. We have a great second set all just can't miss. It, sure. it happens every time. And in fact, one of the gigs that we just did, we kind of bumped out of the gate. It was fine, you know, but we weren't setting anything on fire. All people remember is the last hour, 45 minutes, you know, right. It, right. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, you're right. People are rooting for you. You know, they're there to have a good time. And luckily, uh, the law of averages works to your benefit as well, is that <laughs> people's memories are, what did you leave them with? So, Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's good stuff, man. Hey, we got a... Uh we got that note from Rob into feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Rob says, uh, I was listening to episodes 321 and part of 322. And Paul, you mentioned that out of a three hour rehearsal, one hour might just be vocals. The next two hours might be practicing full songs. This is a new concept to me. Just practicing vocals. Can you break down and tell me what this one hour vocal, vocal rehearsal entails? Our band has three singers, but all four of us sing backups. I think maybe one time we stopped a regular rehearsal and worked on just the vocal parts for a song. I think we could use some more work in this area, and I'm looking for advice. Bonus question, what do you both do to warm up your vocals before a show? So you want to great, you great, start great with this? It's amazing. Yeah, I mean, right. I mean, it's kind of weird. We've been doing this for so long. We've never actually had this specific conversation because it is a great question yeah um let's start with uh, what a vocal rehearsal is so you know i have played with uh people who are great singers who can literally walk in and harmonize yep you know their ears are great their knowledge of their vocal instrument is great and i'm not that guy um, but they could do it around me so if i sang a melody you know they would add two two parts of harmony yep. and we would have three part harmony and it'd be bit like butter. And it was a pretty magical thing. But most of the things that I've done, we have more people who are more willing than, than refined, uh, you know, their game, but yep. um, uh, they need, and some of them are actually quite good instrumental musicians and they, they can sing on pitch, but they're either not entirely confident about their harmonies or, or whatever it might be. And um, so we started a while ago and the returns on it were amazing. Like literally just breaking down a harmony, our piano player would play people's parts uh, and then we would just do it over and over again. Now me, I don't know what's wrong with my freaking brain, but but I don't hear harmonies as easy as I wish I did for playing as long as I can. So I have to do a combination of recording my part playing it on my guitar so I can kind of feel the notes in my body 
you know, do a whole bunch of things to lock my harmony parts in when it when it's not a when it's not a melody. Uh, and I get there, but I have to work pretty darn hard of it. I, I'm you know, not a not a trained singer, not a trained uh, musician, so I just have to work you know three times as hard. Other people have different amounts of effort they have to put into this. Some people hear some of it, and there's certain parts that you know just need to be ironed through. Um, so that's what we would do in our vocal rehearsals: is literally break apart harmonies or invent harmonies. Sometimes sure. we're putting harmonies where there weren't one before, yep. uh, and just you know doing you know and do it to lock it in, do it to lock it in for things like you know mic distance, tonality, phrasing. You know, depending upon the song, whatever the nuance is of making a harmony really, really you know work well. That's what a vocal rehearsal would be with us. And and about an hour, you know, would be a useful thing. Sometimes we do a vocal only rehearsal. Yeah. And that would be, you know, probably two hours, but that's a that's a lot. That's a lot of singing a lot and, a, and a lot of um a, a lot of mental focus in, yeah. in general. Yeah. Yeah. It can get frustrating. So yeah, I I I I think I, I've followed something similar to what you described there. I, I will say and you said this, but to, to shine a light on it, for me, a vocal rehearsal has it, obviously everyone singing. I start without microphones uh, and I'll explain why, but um, one chordal instrument, either a, a guitar, it can be an electric guitar if it needs to be, but you know, not very loud uh, or a piano. Uh, I, t I personally tend to do better in vocal rehearsals with a guitar than a piano, believe it or not. I know a lot of people are the other way, but whatever. Uh, but it's one instrument and then everybody just singing into the air. And I like that because you get to really hear what the other people sound like and what your voices sound like in the air together. And that can be really helpful when, you know, the at the end of things, when you add the the microphones to the mix, you know what you're trying to accomplish. You know what's possible when your voices blend well together. And now you're learning how to use a microphone to, to make that happen in a, you know, amplified in a reinforced way. But I, I really like just singing with someone or with multiple people. Uh, you know, we with Bitter Pill, we actually wound up having some vocal rehearsals just on Billy's porch. Uh, and that was a great place to just sit and play. And hear what each other sounds like and uh, without, you know, without it sort of blasting out of speakers, just hearing it kind of coming from our bodies and from our mouths. So. So I would respond to that in two ways. One, one is um, mastery of your vocal instrument is about being able to sing out into the air. You yeah. know, it is about you know, understanding how to control all aspects of, of, of making sound and blending and that type of thing. It is interesting to me that. It is almost a, another skill set about how you play a PA. Oh, yeah. It's an so, instrument, so that PA, that it, microphone, yep. for sure. Yeah. And, you know, there are some things when I know that the volume is there and I don't have to push as much. And again, this is a non-trained singer, so it's, it's it definitely links back to poor technique. But there is something about not having to push as hard because you know you're not having to worry about the volume part of singing. Yep. Um, or when you hear a nice, rich tone and you're not, again, amateur singer, you're not trying to shape tone. You're just singing and the PA is bringing out all the nice, rich, low tones, you know, that type of thing. Sure. So when you can hear yourself in a PA and you can feel what you're projecting into a room sometimes – it is that that's a different skill than than just being on pitch, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It more, I I suggest starting without the PA on so that you can hear how your voice blends with that of the other people in Fair the band, enough. right? And but then you do need to figure out how to then take that to the PA, and that, to me, that's a part of the same vocal rehearsal. Like I I think if you're going to work on you know a song. Do that, and then unless you've already sort of figured this out as a band, and as time goes by, you will. You know, you'll know, ah, the thing that we're doing here, we've done before. We know how to do that when the microphones are on, so we don't need to 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 learn that right now. But if you don't have that confidence, if you don't have that experience, then 
turning the microphones on after you figured it all out allows you to have that memory of, okay, here's what it sounded like when we sat right next to each other and just sang this thing, but we can't do that at every gig. So we have to use microphones and now let's figure out how to get that same blend happening. And, and this is one of those things I I'm always flabbergasted. You know, you get to a gig, maybe the, the, you know, the house is doing sound and you go around as, as everybody checks their instruments and their levels and you go around and everybody gets their, uh, their shot at asking for, you know, each instrument in their monitors. And it always flabbergasts me when I see a band that, that has singers that sing harmonies. And it's not just like one singer or two lead singers that never sing harmonies with each other or something. But if it's a band that does harmonies, I'm always blown away when I see a band that doesn't want other, when I see some, a vocalist who doesn't want the other vocalists in their monitor. Mm. I don't know how you go about getting that blend. It doesn't work. Like I, I will tell you from hearing these bands, the blend isn't there. It, you know, if you're not hearing those other singers, I ask for all the vocals at the same level in my wedge or if it's, or my ears, like I want everybody at the same level because otherwise I'm not going to hear how to blend with them. And it, 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 it it's, it's craziness to me. I, 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 well, in that I just don't understand it. Uh, how people how people think they're doing it when they can't hear the other vocalists because um, that richness that you hear in your own voice, I think is really important to hear in everybody else's voice because that's how you get that magic blend, right? That's how that works. Yeah. So, but I so in terms of some of the mechanics of this, um, I I often. The first thing I start with in a, at a vocal rehearsal is the lead line. And personally, I find it helpful to, if I'm one of the harmony singers, to learn the lead melody as the lead singer is singing it. And, and I will often sing in unison with them just to make sure I understand their phrasing and their pitch. That helps me find the harmonies that I need to find. If I don't know the lead line, it takes me five times as long to learn a harmony part than if I just take a minute, learn the lead vocal melody, and then the harmonies just sort of start to fall into place for me. But that's very much a me thing. But the first thing I do is make sure the lead vocal line is co correct. And by correct, I mean that it fits within the chords and is, you know, it doesn't have any odd little intonation issues that maybe have crept into the lead singer's uh, muscle memory over the years, you know, it happens to all sure. of us, uh, but, yeah. but right. But really making sure, okay, is the lead line correct? Uh, it doesn't need to be the same. If you're doing playing cover songs or whatever, it doesn't need to be the same as the record, but it does need to fit the chords that the band is playing, right? That, because without that, as you start adding harmonies, you're just going to wind up with some funk and not be able to figure out what's happening. And it's, uh, you know, if it's like, well, if the, the lead singer is, you know, singing a, a, a minor third when it's in a major, you know, a major chord, like this ain't going to fly, especially as you start adding more things to it, it's going to highlight these things. So get that right. And then, um, and then the, do the same thing with the harmony line, right? Make, find a harmony line that also fits within the chords and matches the singer. And it, so you're making sure that your harmonies, your melodies are, uh, are correct in that they fit the chords and they fit with each other. And then it's all about phrasing to me. That's, that's the next thing. Uh, having it, making sure that you as the harmony singer or all of the harmony singers are matching that same phrasing as the lead singer will make those harmonies tight. And if you need to listen to examples of this, go find some country music Go or listen to Eagles, right? Because they were effectively a country band, although nobody called them that at the time. Uh, and as, a, as an added bonus, have the harmony lines end their pitch before the lead line does, right? So don't have the harmony, unless, it's, unless you're intentionally doing it, make sure the harmonies stop right before the lead vocal stops. And that's going to make it sound tight and take all the sibilance out of the harmony lines. Don't sing T's. Don't sing S's. Just sing notes. You can sing the words, 
but don't over enunciate them if you're the harmony singer. Let the lead singer do that. And that way you'll get nice, tight, crisp T's and S's because they're only coming from one person. And like, so I would actually pause you here because yeah. there's an interesting way to, to tilt this, right? For many people playing popular cover music, yeah. the Eagles are kind of held up as the holy grail of what you're aiming for for harmonies. And I would actually say that's not always true. Like that is, the Eagles would be pristine multi-part harmony, right? Sure. There's a lot of popular music, a lot of rock music where where the the harmony is sonically correct. The note, the distance of the notes are correct. Yep. The phrasing might be a little sloppy by design. That's the style of music that it might be, right? I mean, Keith Richards um, certainly know. defined that, but he was also out of tune most of the time too with his harmonies. But that that harmony, like uh, the third verse of Brown Sugar, I'll take it every day. Yep, it's terrible. There you go. It's it's classically terrible, and it's awesome. Yeah, there, yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. So the the, the terrible is. Um, is lightning in a jar that the mistakes that were made work so well? Right? Yeah, that's that's superstardom, right? That's, that's but I'm not Keith you can't, Richards. I don't, that's right. Well, that's the thing is you can't. I don't think you can bank on that. But my point is, there's plenty and plenty of rock music. Yeah, less less funk and soul. Certainly less soul music, where where perfect pristine harmonies. Um, there's plenty of rock music where. Uh, for lack of a better, I'm going to get myself in trouble here, but in the ballpark harmonies yeah. will we'll win the day for a lot of things, right? Not everything has to be Eagles harmony. No, it doesn't. But that's a good place to start. Like taking the lessons that we can learn from the Eagles, not over enunciating things, keeping things tight, starting a harmony, you know, with the lead singer ending before the lead singer, these sort of just general lessons are going to make your band work better when you're in a scenario where the the sound is kind of, you know, swimming around in the room a little bit. You, you know, it, there's some magic that can happen when harmonies are not, are imperfect uh, from a classical sense. And don't get me wrong. M many of us, even when we go through all these exercises, we're still going to wind up with harmonies that are imperfect. It's how it works, right? Mm -hmm. We're humans out there doing it. But when you're working these things out, when you, you, you I, I don't, I don't think it's smart to set the bar low on the day that you are doing your vocal rehearsal, right? Mm -hmm. Know what the, 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 you know, the bar to hit is. And if you don't hit that in every performance, well, that's, a, I mean, I guess that that can be okay. Uh, depends on what your performances are, but I, I think I think it's important to know what is going to be correct and what's going to fit the song, because otherwise, I mean, especially if you take it into the studio or something, you start doing some recording. Like if if you haven't worked this stuff out in advance, you're going to be spending time to fix that there uh, and wow. get it right. So, I yeah, I, I I'm with you that that there is. I, I mean, you know, you look at. Even like Mike Mills from R.E.M., one of the best rock and roll harmony singers, uh, you know, consistently throughout his career. There are there are plenty of Mike Mills harmonies that are more about the energy of them than the uh, perfect blend of him with Stipe. Right. Like there, there are a lot of them that just don't classically blend. But. You know, it, I think it's they still deliver the goods. You got to deliver the goods. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I would actually also say about that yeah. is that whatever you hear on an, on an REM record, it's a choice, right? Yes. It's not it's not from lack of rehearsal. I mean, they're saying, yeah, this conveys what we want to convey. So, right. so my point to all this is that the approach to harmonies, you know, it's not always Eagles harmony. That it, it's a choice, you know, yes. depending on the song, depending on whatever you're going to do. That that's more of what my point is yeah. uh, about. About harmonies. Your point is well taken, though. Is like, wouldn't it be nice to be able to have the choice to approach it as Beatles harmony, as right. Eagles Beatles harmony, or or, or, be or REM Beach Boys harmony. or Beach Boys? If you're going to say, yeah. wouldn't it be nice? I mean, come on, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well played, sir. Uh, that's a great tune. That's a I I dissected those harmonies once. I don't know, ten or fifteen years ago. Uh, man, like, there's just so much great stuff going on in those tunes. Yeah. And especially Jeez. that particular tune. Gosh. Yeah. 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 All right. So, well, that's vocal rehearsals 
feedback at geekgabpodcast.com. Let us know if you have any thoughts on that. Are we right? Are we wrong? Do you do something different? Let us know. This can be a, a thing that we all, you know, contribute to and, and we all learn from because none of us can possibly know everything, especially when we're I'd be interested in it when, the, when the listener asks, you know, what do you do with a vocal rehearsal? Are, are they, are they all the, those types of singers that don't need them and they walk in and they're, and they're, and they're butter? I mean, I don't, you know, I think about, and Bitter Pill, we've gotten to the point now where many times we can, the three of us can just jump in and, and sing. Uh, but we've, we know it's not that we're coming in blind, right? We've had, there have been several key moments in the course of the last few years where we've had harmonies crystallize and we've all learned things. And now we know, OK, you know, there's there's in Bitter Pill, we have the benefit of, you know, what I call blood harmonies or family harmonies, because we've got Billy and Emily, father and daughter. And for a long time, we kept thinking we needed the two of them right next to each other. And then me either below them both or above them both. What we learned was the best way for it to sound is to have me in the middle of them both. Right. And so in general, that's where we default to. Right. And we know how to make those blends happen. We know how to sing with each other because we've done enough gigs where we're starting to figure that out. Uh, but there are times I mean, there are a couple of songs where Emily, especially Emily and I, we cross paths in, in our harmonies all the time. I, I know we both know it, at least in that we do it the same way at every gig, but I don't know that we've ever talked about it for every single one of those tunes. Right. So you can get to a point with a band and the same thing happened with fling. I mean, it took us a long time for me and Aaron to figure out how to sing together. And then one day standing here in my studio, we were working on some uh, songs for an acoustic gig and we hadn't really ever played an acoustic gig before. And we had one coming up like that weekend and so we were dissecting a bunch of fling songs to do. And for some reason, Aaron said, what if we throw Mrs. Robinson in? And I was like, oh, yeah, I know that song. You know that song? Great. You, you want which part do you want? He says, I'll take the low part. I'm like, great. I'll, I'll take the high part. I got Garfunkel. And we sang it. And the first time through, you know, all five of us looked at each other like, holy crap. Wait a minute. We just figured it out. This We finally broken through. And, and that lesson then carried into every fling song from that day forward, right? It wasn't just, well, now Mrs. Robinson sounds good and the rest of the stuff sounds like crap. You know, once you learn how to sing together, uh, you, you can sort of hedge your bets and more often than not walk in and make it butter. It's not always going to be the case. Like sometimes you just got to sit down and work it out. Uh, we had one tune. It's kind of like the lesson of our of our buddies in the Coffus Brothers, right? Like, yeah, brother harmonies, family harmonies are a thing. You know the way the other person breathes. You know the way yeah. the other person intonates, and so you can learn that with with good bandmates that you are absolutely to learning. About yeah, that. yeah. Aaron and I got to the point where we have brother harmonies. I mean, it's like we we don't we don't have to think about it. We can sing unisons with each other in any scenario, and we trust each other implicit. Like unisons are to me the most dangerous harmony to sing. Because if one person is slightly off, either with it's phrasing off. or intonation, it's the yeah. worst thing in the world. And Aaron and I got to a point a decade ago where it's like, oh, yeah, we'll just sing unisons all night long if you want. Like, we, we, we don't need to in most songs. Like, most songs don't need that. But there are some songs where it really works. And we have no fear about it because we completely – it's not even that we trust each other. It's that we know each other, right? It's it's like you said. you You do it enough. And family harmonies, that happens because you're doing it when you're kids and just hanging around the house. So, uh, but yeah, I, 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 I've never found a band where it just magically works without intention or, or even not intentional, but, but time spent without time spent. I don't, I don't see how you get there. I don't know. Maybe mm -hmm. John Donahue and I locked in, in uh, monkey fist and chafed. He and I locked in right out of the gate that, but he is, he is the perfect copycat singer. Like whenever he sings a song, he sounds more like the original artist than anyone else I know. 
Mm. And and so I like again, I know what he's going to do because I know the song that he is singing, right? And now we've I mean we've been singing together for years, so it's different now. Now we just know each other. But uh I have no trouble singing with him. It's it's like butter with him. And it was pretty good out of the gate, but I'm sure it wasn't as good as it is now. So cool. Yeah, it's good. I have a question for you. Um that well, really I'm asking Rob's question. Uh what do you do for a vocal warm up on the way to a gig or at the gig? Well, uh me personally, I am a big proponent of, I have a whole vocal, vocal warm-up thing that I do religiously on a drive to the gig. Yep. And I like, it, I like it to be done about two hours before a gig, 90 minutes before a gig. So it's, you know, scales up and down, different vowels up and down. I, I, am, a, I am a hardcore warmer upper, and that's really good. My band does not do vocal warm-ups. And when, when Chris, our new bass player, joined the band, he, you know, was not adamant, but I mean, he really strongly suggested it. We often, you know, the... Time just gets away from us often. It just doesn't, between the stress of getting set up on whatever limited amounts of time we have and just wanting a couple minutes to get zen before, you know, we yeah. actually take the stage. But, you know, let's hold it up to the light. You know, what what it really is the best use of time, you know. I, I, I'm like you. I warm up in the car on the way to the gig. It's the right timing usually for me to get warm and then go be able to sing, like you said, 90 minutes later and two hours later, you know, whatever it works out to be once you get there and you set up and sound check and all that. Uh, I, I have, I have a playlist in my car that I have found works very well. Really it's two songs and really it's two versions of the same song. It's REM's finest work song singing the, the lead, the Michael Stipe part for the first one through it doesn't cause me to stretch at all. I can just warm up my chest and get the air flowing and get, you know, all my, my chest and, and diaphragm muscles working the way that, that I need them to and get them loose. And then the second time through, I sang the Mike Mills harmonies, which are a stretch for me. Uh, but by that point, you know, my muscles are in the right spot. My throat's in the right spot. And, uh, and I, not only does it warm me up, but it warns me up too. It teaches me how my voice is going to be that day and where I need to watch out, <laughs> which is, which is, I think, just as valuable as being warmed up, knowing, okay, today is this day. Got it. I yep. know what I know. I know where I should jump to falsetto earlier uh, on this stuff. I, you know, whatever, whatever those lessons are, two songs, 10 minutes, I'm, I'm in good shape. I'm actually finding that the use of warm-ups gives my voice a little bit more consistency, especially if I have a three or four day in a row type of thing. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because I can still do these solo acoustic or duo gigs. I could do those seven days a week and it not be a problem. But, you know, in the when the energy gets going, amateur singer here, I will tend to push in a rock show and and sing in a style, you know, that that I might not probably wouldn't sing at if it was just me. Yeah. And I can I can, you know, take a little bit off my range. You know, if I do that, but I find that the warm ups kind of give me a nice consistency and make they also, you, you know, reinforce good habits about how to go up your range. So when I go up, you know, I, I'm, I'm less likely to shout or push or anything yeah. like that. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. One that I use is um, there's a vocal coach out there. His name's Ken Tamplin, T A M P L I N. And I think he has a. I've had it for years, so I think it must be a free download it's called Vocal Warm Up for Dudes. It's about a 30 minute warm up, several vowels, several different scales, um, and it's just my go to. And yeah. it's it's almost like a it's almost like a comfort blanket to me. If I if I can feel things going okay in this warm up, I know it's gonna be a I know it's gonna be a good game. That's great. That's great. I, I think I found that. And so I will uh, I will put a link in the show notes at giggabpodcast.com. Good stuff. Great questions, Rob. Thank you for that. You just uh, you just added twenty six minutes to this episode. That was awesome. <laughs> well, it's a it's a good thing. I mean, I, I'm like you said, we've been doing this seven plus years and really haven't talked about that. I know we've talked about our warm ups a little bit, but I don't think we've ever talked about how we go about you know learning how to sing with our bands, and that's really what this is about, right? Learning how to sing with your band is is the key. So. Yeah. All right. Good stuff. You got anything else today, man? 
No, I, we got some good stuff in the queue for next time already. But the, this one took a little longer. So looking forward to talking to you next week as well. Yeah, man. Me too. Me too. I love doing this. Thanks for listening, folks. Again, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Send in your thoughts on this stuff. Send in your questions. And uh, yeah, if we make some offhanded comment that leaves you with a question, you might be responsible for 26 minutes like Rob was. What's that ABP, thing we say? ABP. 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 